Yeah, it should be shall be. I don't think we have too many do we? I know there was like probably two maybe like Matt Watson. Or is this a new no this is a new track we this is the second one, right? Second one, yeah. Uh Another one. Oh, Army yeah. boy should be there. Yeah, What's his name? I can forget his name. Marvin. You guys have any money train? Yeah, Lynn. Lynn. Yeah. Lynn. Yeah. 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 Y
Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to go to the bathroom, but I kind of come back and go to the bathroom. No, that means that W. So there we go. Yeah. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. Hopefully, I can see it clearly. That's pretty clear. Uh, one thing is, what we should do? I hope it's um mirror the video. What is it you trying to do? Oh, we're good. I'm near, near the video. So when I'm pointing over here, it looks like I'm pointing over here. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I can like, when I'm looking at myself, I know I'm pointing this way, not this way. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. The other way would be reversed, but <laughs> you're pointing over here and it would look like you're pointing. <laughs> you catch, man. <laughs> uh, I need the speaker thing. What's up, Ashlyn? Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, I can. Okay. I'm over here typing an email. Give me one second. Sounds good. How was that working Women's Wednesday? It was good. It was really nice. Beautiful. Good. everyone a couple minutes to hop in here. Right. 
don't know if we got more than this, but we're going to do it like this here. All right, cool. All right, we're just going to just go with what we have today. Um, as you guys can see, the topic we're going to go over is the list of concerns. Okay, so the list of concerns is probably probably one of the most important parts of the whole presentation. This is where you're going to get to show your expertise. You're going to be able to break down the coverage for them. You're going to be able to paint the picture and make life insurance real. Okay. Um, I know I've told Ashlyn this many times and, and I say it all the time, but guys, life insurance, the product that we have for our members, it's not tangible. You cannot hold it in your hand. It is not a shovel. You cannot use it to go out and dig ditches, right? It's not a vacuum cleaner. The product that we have and that we're helping our members with is something that's, you know, it's a piece of paper. It's a feeling. It's an emotion, right? It's more built on what goes on up here than actually physical, right? The only time that they're ever going to have that money is if God forbid something happens to that person, right? So we have to figure out a way to make this tangible to them, to compare it to tangible things, right? The best way to do that as an agent and as a representative is to paint the picture of that family without one of their members. Paint the picture of that family if something catastrophic happens. Right, because that's the only way that they're really going to understand this because it hasn't happened to them. Right now, before I get into list of the list of concerns, um, I need to give you guys some background on why it exists. Right. So first off, our, our company is a hundred percent union label life insurance company, which means we don't advertise. We don't put money into advertising. We don't have any talking ducks. We don't have any discount double checks. We don't have any Geico caveman, right? Our company only really represents union members. So we have a very strong niche market, right? Now this comes back from when, you know, Mr. Rappaport started the, the company. He thought, would I be one of thousand companies representing 80% of people or the one company that represents 20% of people? He took the one company route. Right. So very, very niche market. Uh, now, guys, what I'm getting at that is our programs are approved by the union president. So the union president of, like, say, the Teamsters, he sat down with our PR team and he approved our program for his members. Right? Now, do you guys know how a union president gets in power? Do you know how they get to that position? No, they're voted in. It's like a presidency. They're voted in to that position. So all the people in the union, all the union workers, they take a vote and they vote for who they think is going to do the best job for them and who's going to represent them as a people. Right? So would they vote for somebody who's putting bad programs in place for their families? Would they, put a, would, they, would they put a person in power as a president of, of a union if they were doing the wrong things for their members? And the answer is no, they wouldn't, right? So our, and what I'm getting at is our union presidents, they're backing our programs. They're, they're saying that to telling their members that our programs are great for them. They're approving our programs, right? So there's already a built-in demographic with us. It's, it's a great thing, right? Now, what I'm really getting at with that whole, you know, union president thing is the fact that our company, we sit down with what's called a labor advisory board to make sure that our members have the best programs and all of our programs take care of their main concerns, right? So the labor advisory board is made up of 50 different union presidents. And all those presidents get together and they vote on programs for the union, right? So what I have here is the labor advisory board, 
right? There are 50 different presidents on this board here. As we go from D. Marie Smith, who is the president of the NFL Players Association, right? We also have James Hoffa down here, who's the president of the Teamsters, right? In Chicago, the Teamsters are very, very famous. Jimmy Hoffa is a very, very famous person, okay? So, and there's union presidents from every single union on here. We got um, the international machinists and aerospace workers. We have roof, roofers and allied uh, water workers. We have um, geographical communication workers. There's, a, there's a, a screen actors guild on here as well, right? Police officer union, right? The other ones that are, 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 are important up here are the president, the vice president, the chairman, and the CEO of the Labor Advisory Board, right? I don't know if you guys could see this or not, but Roger Smith and Steve Greer, they're the C, Steve, Steve Greer, who is the president of our company, is also the CEO of the Labor Advisory Board, right? So the Labor Advisory Board is a huge thing. It makes decisions for their, for their members, right? Every union president has a say. And based on what they say and, and what they feel is best for their members, we put into our programs, right? So in the presentation, when we're going through the term versus whole, which Josh taught you guys on Monday, right? After we get down with the term versus whole, we should project ourselves as experts to them. At that point, once they feel that we're experts, once we've projected our knowledge to them, we're gonna be able to break down their coverage and break down their unique situation, right? So the transition for going from term life to whole life, you know, into the list of concerns is a pretty simple one, right? Especially if they're union members, right? You know, it's typically, you know, Mary and Joe, you know, we, we've all gone through contract negotiations at work and benefit changes, right? Um, you know, I'm sure that you've gone through some of them too at work. And it always seems like we're, you know, giving more and getting less, right? But, um, you know, basically, you know, your labor advisory board, your list of, of, of union presidents came to us uh, and, and they said that there's a bunch of concerns that their members had. And we broke that big list of concerns down to about six different areas, okay? Now, each team does this pie chart differently, right? but it's all the same information, okay? This pie chart or the list of concerns, there's six concerns, right? The first concern is making sure that our benefits are permanent and portable to that member, right? So all of our programs are permanent and portable. What you, basically you would say the biggest concern that our union members have is making sure that they get to keep their benefits once they leave work. The good thing about all of our programs is that they're all permanent and portable to you as an individual, not you as a union member, right? So a lot of people think that they, they're gonna get coverage here and they're like, oh man, it's gonna stop when, when I stop working. It's not the case. It's why we exist, guys. It's why our company exists. Because union presidents found out that they have great benefits through work but once their members quit, fire, retire from their positions, those benefits go away. They don't get to keep them anymore, All right? So number one for the list of concerns is permanent and portable benefits. The number two list of, on the list of concerns, or what I would say is like Mary and Joe, the, the second area where a lot of our members had problem, problems and concerns was final expense protection. So F. E, final expense, all right? Now, for this part to be effective, you have to communicate with the member. You have to talk to them. You can't just project things to them and show them and then not get answers back. This part right here should be very back and forth with the member. You should talk to them here, all right? The more that 
they bring to light, the better you are able to help them out. Right? I will always tell people that statements don't sell, questions do. Right? So if you want to effectively help this person, you got to find out what they need. And the order, only way to find out what they need or what their concerns are is to ask them questions. Right? So the first question you're going to ask for final expense protection, Mary and Joe, do you know how much a funeral costs nowadays? And they're going to give you some, some, some different answers. You're here, you're here. People say, Oh yeah. 10 to 15,000. You're also here. Some people say 40,000. You hear some people say 5,000, right? Whatever they say here, be like, yeah, that's pretty close. Pretty close nationwide average guys for a funeral is 10 to $15,000. That's nationwide average for a funeral. Cremation's a little bit cheaper. You know, cremation, you could probably get away with maybe five to 10. Right? But just like every year, everything becomes more expensive every year. Your milk, your eggs, your bread, your gas, right? The materials used to make this webcam right now, right? The materials used to make this whiteboard. Everything doubles in price after 20 years. That's standard inflation. Guys, inflation is like 3% a year. 3.000 something, 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 something percent, right? So every single year, prices go at 3%. Over 20 years, that doubles the price. So what I typically do with our members here is I already know how old they are, right? I, I usually project out, I, I project back 20 years. So Mary and Joe, 20 years ago, the price for a funeral was probably about five to $10,000, right? Think about it. You guys are pretty young, so you probably might not have some insight on this, right? But 20 years ago, gas prices, I remember my parents paying $1.50, $1.25 a gallon. It's now three bucks. Right? And, and in the 90s, it was a dollar, maybe a dollar, maybe 75 cents. But every 20 years, like I said, it's doubling. So what you want to do is you want to project back for them. So Mary and Joe, 20 years ago, funeral was probably about five to $10,000. Nowadays, it's about 10 to 15. And then 20 years down the road, we're looking at 20 to 30,000 for that same funeral. Now, guys, if they're, if they're in their 40s, 20 years only puts them at 60. The life expectancy for a human being, for a man, it's 79. For a woman, it's 83. Right? So if this person, if they're 20, if they're in this position, let's say that they're 41, that's how old they are. This only puts them at 61. That's not the end of their life, right? The end of their life is going to be another 20 years down the road. We're looking at 40 to 60,000 for final expenses down the road. Right? So if they're young, project out more. If they're in their 20s, project out another 20 years. I customize this to your members. It's going to make you look good. It's going to make you look like you're paying attention to them. Right? So having their age up here, say, Joe, right now you guys are 40 and 43 years old. You know, 20 years prior, you guys were 20 and 23 years old. I don't know if you remember getting gas, but it was pretty cheap back then. But just like I said, every 20 years, the prices are doubling. And 20 years down the road, it's only going to put you at 61 years old. What they suggest to have and enforce for final expenses, about 20 to 30,000. Right? 20 more years is going to put you at 81, where life expectancy is at. And that's going to be about 40 to 60,000. Right. So 
this is actually the only area where our company and the needs analysis suggest you use whole life insurance to protect. Because a funeral is not an if, that's a when, right? We're all guaranteed two things in life, guys. We're guaranteed death. You guys know the other one? No? Taxes. Taxes. Ashlyn's heard me say it in the presentation, so she knows, right? So death and taxes are the two guarantees in life. Now, I've seen people get around paying taxes. Never seen anybody cheat death, though. No one gets around it. Evil can evil maybe once or twice he cheated death, but at the end, he's dead now, right? He didn't die in an accident, but he did die. Right? So final expense is typically the main thing that you're going to protect with whole life insurance because that is a when. Right? When they pass away. Now, once I figure out kind of where they're going, what they're going to need coverage wise here, I circle it. I say, so what it's going to typically recommend for your situation is about forty to sixty thousand dollars of whole life insurance. And once again, I ask them, do you guys have any questions on what it would recommend for final expenses for you? And then they say no. I say, okay. Now, but do you guys have any questions on final expenses? How to explain it, how to walk through it with them? Okay. All right. Now, the, the, the third concern, and this is how I would transition, or the next concern, or the third concern, um, is income protection. Making sure that if Joe or Mary does not come home from work tomorrow, that at least their paycheck does every single month, right? So IP, income protection. Now at this point, Typically what I do is I ask them how important their income is. I would say, Joe, if it's Joe and Mary, I would say, Joe, does Mary rely on your paycheck? And he would say, yes. And I would say, Mary, does Joe rely on your paycheck? And they would say, yes, right? You're going to run, but you will run into situations where one person's working, one person isn't right. Just still ask the question, right? Because it's going to make it make sense to them. So Joe, you know, safe to say that if, if something happened to you and you didn't come home from work tomorrow, that your, your wife would still need your paycheck every single month, right? To pay for the house and keep the bills paid and the food on and lights on the table, right? He would say, yeah. I would say, okay, so your, your paycheck's very important to the household. It's kind of like the lifeline of the house, right? So I would say safe to say, Mary and Joe, um, that if either one of you passed away, the paycheck from both of you guys is pretty important. All right, so typically what our company recommends is they recommend three to five years of their income to protect it. Three to five years. Because what that's going to do is give them three to five years of time to figure it out. The money's great. $200,000 is great. Right, two hundred thousand dollars is never going to bring Joe back. But what it will do is it'll give Mary time to move forward without having to change too much real quick, really quickly. She won't have to adjust her lifestyle too too quick because she has the paycheck coming in every single month. Right. So, if you guys really want to think about it, our members' paychecks. And their income is kind of like their lifeline, right? You guys have seen a heartbeat, right? It goes up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And it keeps going, right? I know it's pretty bad, but you get it. <laughs> so that's kind of like what, what a paycheck is like too, right? You guys think about it. So if... The up spike, Joe gets paid here. He gets $800. That's 
Downspike, he got bills, right? You got to pay out $800. Upspike, he makes another $800. Downspike, he's got medical bills, something like that comes up. He has to pay $250, right? Upspike again, he's making money. Downspike, he's losing money, right? Your, your paycheck, this paycheck is kind of like his life. They're never going to be stagnant, right? It's always going to be up and down. It's going to have good days. It's going to have bad days. You're going to have good paychecks where you get a lot of money. You're going to have a lot of bills come in where you have to pay a lot of money. That's just how life works. Everybody's got bills, right? So why I'm getting at that is because if Joe doesn't come home and Joe dies, this is what his lifeline looks like then. Flatline. His heartbeat stopped. You know what else stopped? The paychecks. Right? No more paychecks coming in. It's a flat line. No more money for the family. Right? So his paycheck or her paycheck is really the lifeline of the family. If something happens and their paycheck is cut off, boom. It's a financial heart attack for that family. So what income protection does is it makes sure that if Joe does not come home from work, that every single month, $3,000 comes into the house for the next five years. Right. Now, to make this section real with them, just ask them questions. Right. So, Joe, to make sure that, you know, the needs analysis accurately represents your situation. What do you guys usually bring home every month? Let's say Joe said three thousand bucks. And let's just say Mary said two thousand bucks. All right, so they make five grand as a family. That's not bad. That pays the bills, it keeps them floating, right? So if Joe gets paid $3,000 a month, you multiply that by 12 months, we're looking at, I don't know, $36,000 for the year, right? And Mary's over here making $24,000 for that year, All right? So if we multiply this by five, so that's what, six, 600,000? No, I did math wrong. I'm so bad at math. <laughs> six times five is 30. Three times five is 15 plus three is 18. So 180,000. That's what I meant to say. There we go. $180,000. So what that means is Joe, is $180,000 asset to that family. Over the next five years, no matter what, as long as Joe goes to work, that $180,000 is gonna come into the family to help protect them, to help keep food on the table, to put money in the kids' pockets, to buy Mary new dresses, right? That $1,800, that $180,000 is gonna come in. The only way it's not gonna come in is if Joe, doesn't come home from work. He's gone. So they need a replacement of $180,000 for Joe. Mary, right? Let's just say this is, I don't know, it's like 125,000. I know it's a little bit less than that, but just ease of numbers. Mary, same thing for you, Mary. If something happens to you, Mary, no matter what, you're going to bring in that 125 for the next five years. But if you don't come home, Mary, that 125 is gone too. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> All right, give me a second. Uh, Tommy needs the microphone and everything, guys. So give me a minute. I got to switch some things up. Give me one second.
All right, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, it's probably not as clear, but we're gonna have to do it this way, it's okay. All right, you can hear me though still? All right, good. All right, so final or uh, income protection. So we know Joe needs 180,000 and Mary needs 125,000. That represents five years of Mary's income and five years of Joe's income. It's pretty simple math. It's not too difficult to do. Whatever they make per month, multiply by 12 and then multiply by either three or five. I usually do five. Now, if they're younger, use three. If they're old, I mean, if they're younger, use five. If they're older, use three, right? But this is a visual representation of what they bring in. Guys, they know that they bring a paycheck into the house. They know that. Their wife knows that. The husband knows that the paycheck comes in on every other Friday, right? They know that stuff. But what they don't typically know is how much it is, how much it does for the family, because they don't, they don't really see it every day. They just live their life. Does that make sense? So you got to bring it to life for them. Like, Mary, if you did die tomorrow, there's $125,000 that Joe's going to miss out on. For the next, and the family's going to miss out on over the next five years. Joe, you're a hundred and eighty thousand dollar asset to this family. They might not treat you like it, right? But you're a hundred eighty thousand dollar asset to the family. So, with income protection, guys, you always want to just make sure you you get what they make and then project it out five years. It's pretty, yeah, income protection is pretty easy to kind of show them because it's a, it is a physical thing. They get a paycheck. They understand where that paycheck comes from. It comes from them going to work every day, right? And they understand that if they don't go to work, guess what doesn't come home? Paycheck, right? So income protection is pretty easy to, to kind of go over with them. Now, a lot of the times, guys, you got, you're going to realize that a lot of the time people have coverage. People we sit down with have life insurance. And a lot of the time they have it and it's term, which isn't a bad thing. It's not bad, right? Now, if someone has coverage, let's just say that they don't have anything whole life wise, but they have a lot of term. Let's just say he has $500,000 of term coverage. Whoops. Right? So if, he, if I know he has 500,000, right? All, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend it. I'm going to say, Joe, it's great that you got that five thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars of coverage there, but what that's going to go to is protecting your income. So if something happens, you know, Mary, she's going to you know use that for the next ten years to pay off her income. And then they're going to ask me, what wouldn't it pay for final expenses too? Theoretically, yes. But guys, here, here's what happens. Stay with me here. Uh, Ashlyn, I'm going to use you as an example. Let's just say, Ashlyn, me and you, we went down to 7-Eleven down the street, and we needed to get milk, eggs, and bread. And it was like 15 bucks. And in my left pocket, I had a $20 bill. And in my right pocket, I had a $100 bill. Am I going to use the $20 bill or the $100 bill to pay for that? The 20. The 20, right? That's, that's the right answer. That's the right answer. Why would you say the $20 bill, though? I don't know, I guess, because um, it feels it's closer to the right amount. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's typically what most people say, just exactly what you said. It's typically the response you get, right? So the reason why you wouldn't use the $100 bill is because that if you use the 100 you have change, right? You're going to get four 20s back and a $5 bill. What typically happens, though, when you break that 100 you end up spending it, right? It's not a hundred dollar bill anymore. It's gone. You spend it, right? That's the same way that they're going to, that's the same thing they're going to do with their coverage, guys. If she takes this $500,000 policy and uses 30 of it, to pay for the funeral, the rest of that money is just going to go. It's going to disappear. She's going to buy things she doesn't need because it's already being spent, right? So that's why I recommend whole life insurance for the final expenses. And it recommends term or accidental to take care of the income. 
Okay, that's called that's called the like the hundred dollar bill theory. Most people will, will be in that situation. They'll 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 tell you twenty dollars because they know how their mind works. If they have a hundred dollar bill in their pocket, they're not breaking it. It's probably been in there for a while, right? That's the same way that it's going to work with their with their life insurance. So what I would recommend, if even if they had five hundred thousand dollars a term. I'd still recommend anywhere from forty to sixty thousand of whole life insurance, because that term number one is eventually going to go away, and number two, if you do pass away and you have that term, and you use it for the final expenses, the rest of it is going to disappear too. And if you get them to agree to that, if you get them to say, "Yeah, usually I'll spend that hundred," then they know that they're going to spend that. All right. Now, another very, very good way to pitch income protection to somebody is with what's called the ATM clause, right? Now, this one is, you're not gonna use this one a lot, but I just wanna give it to you just so you have it. Let's say, let's say that in, in your basement, I'm just gonna use it, Ashlyn again. In your basement, Ashlyn, you have um, an ATM machine, right? Now, there's two versions of the ATM machine you can get. You can get one of them that every single month, it'll spit you out $4,000, no matter what. Like, as, it'll, it'll, as long as it's working, as long as it's operating, $4,000 is gonna come out to you every single month. So that would be option A. Option B would be to have the same exact ATM machine except it only spit out $3,500 every month. But it came with a warranty that said, even if it broke down, that $3,500 is gonna come out every month, no matter what. So you have option B, uh, an ATM machine with a warranty, you're gonna get $500 less a month, or you have option A with no warranty and you're gonna get $4,000 a month. So would you, choose vending, or would you choose ATM machine A or ATM machine, ATM machine B? B. You take B, right? It's an easy answer. It's, you take B. And then I, I would ask him, you know, even though, Ashlyn, you're getting $500 less a month, you would still take option B. Why? Because the warranty. Because of the warranty. Even though you're losing $500, that warranty is worth it to you, right? Because it's guaranteed to pay out. Well, hate to break the news to you, Ashlyn, but uh, unfortunately, you can't just buy an ATM machine for your basement. You know, they don't really exist. <laughs> but, but the good thing is, too, is that you're the ATM machine of the house, if you really think about it, right? Every single month, you're going to go to work, and you're going to put $4,000 into the home, $4,000 to come in, right? The only way it's not is if you're broken down. And if you're broken down, at least here, you know your family's going to get it. $180,000. Even if you break down all the way to where you, you do pass away, all that money is still going to come out to your family. So you see how I'm comparing that person and their paycheck to an ATM, right? The ATM is really good because people understand what an ATM does. It gives them money. It pulls money out for them, right? They might not think of themselves as an ATM, but that's typically what they are for the house. It sucks to break down someone's life into just pushing money out. But typically, as a breadwinner and as an income earner, that's how it works. They don't get that $4,000 and it goes right to their bank account. <laughs> I get spent up, right? So income protection is a big area of where most people are going to need coverage. Just because they don't have coverage, guys. People will have coverage through work. That will can be considered income protection. So if they have you know, $200,000 of income protection through work, typically not going to argue with them. I'm just going to be like, you have, you, have, you have what you need covered there at that point, and I'm going to go somewhere else, right? But if they only have, um, you know, 100000 at work, and their need is $200,000, i will show them $100,000 because there's a need there, all right? So there's a $100,000 need there. But if they don't have a need there, don't beat a dead horse, guys. Go on to the next thing. Does that make sense? 
Now, do you guys have any questions on income protection at all? No? All right, beautiful. All right, income protection. Okay. So, the fourth concern that a lot of our members brought to our attention is mortgage protection. Now, I know you guys on the other team there, you use like uh, debt, kids education on this side and mortgage protection on this side, but it doesn't matter. They're interchangeable. So MP is mortgage protection. This one, this concern here, guys, is something that you really kind of don't really have to paint a huge picture for. They understand that they live, they, they own a house. The only things you got to bring to light are the fact that they pay a mortgage, right? So I asked them a question here. I say, Mary and Joe, do you guys rent or do you own where you're at right now? And if they say own, I'm gonna say, great. Is it paid off or do you still have a mortgage to the bank? And they'll probably say, I still have a mortgage. I would say, okay. So if something happens, you know, the bank actually owns the house, right? They get them to realize that if they have a mortgage, they don't own that house, the bank does. And until it's paid off, the bank owns the house. So if something happens and Joe doesn't come home, Mary still has to pay that mortgage. The bank's not going to go, oh my goodness, I know Joe passed away. So we're going to like lower the mortgage a thousand dollars. You only got to pay 200 bucks this month. Doesn't work like that, guys. I wish it did. A lot of people would have more houses. You know, the foreclosure rate wouldn't be as high. But unfortunately, that's the way it works. So typically, a lot of our members want to have their whole mortgage paid off when they pass away. And if I asked Mary and Joe a question, I would say, Mary and Joe, do you guys rent or do you own? And if they say own, I would say, okay, fantastic. Is, is the house paid off or do you guys still owe some money to the bank? And they go, no, no, we, we, owe, we owe money to the bank. I would say, okay, how much you got left on the house there? Let's say 150,000. I write it down. Whatever they say, I write it down and I visually represent it to them. That's what we should be taking away from this. Is every time they say something, every kind of dollar amount, we got to visually represent it to them. All right? This goes back to like old school sales and, and napkin math. When we were in the home with them, I would draw this circle out on a piece of paper and I would work it out with them right then and there. When we're on Zoom, actually, we have that, that, that PowerPoint pulled up. You can draw right on the screen with them right there, right? Um, but mortgage protection, like that $150,000, if something happens, the bank still wants this money. They're still going to ask you for that money every single month. They don't care that you passed away. What mortgage protection would do would make sure that if something happened to either you, Joe, or you, Mary, that that $150,000 would come into the home and you could pay off the mortgage and it wouldn't be a concern anymore. All right? Now, if they rent, you could do the same thing. If they rent, they're like, no, I rent. Okay, well, what's your rent every single month? What are you guys paying rent a month? Thousand bucks? All right? Multiply that by 12, it's $12,000 $12, a year, right? And then I always project it out five years. I give them five years to live in that home, right? So what I, I do is I take their rent, $1,000 a month, multiply it by a year, it's 12,000, right? Multiply it by five, we're looking at 60 grand, right? So over the next five years, you guys will have put $60,000 in the, in the rent for this house. This rent protection would make sure that if something happened to either you, Joe, or you, Mary, that you guys could pay off the rent and still live in the same house for the next five years and not have to worry about where the money's coming from to keep the food on the table and the, and the, the lights on the, on the table. Or, so to, to keep the, the lights in the house and keep the house there so they don't have to actually move. You got to remember, guys, the biggest thing we're doing for this family is making sure that if someone in this family dies, that their whole lifestyle isn't changed. They can just live the way that they were living and not have to worry about anything. 
That's the biggest fear for people. When someone in our family dies, it's what's going to happen afterwards, right? Because they were used to a certain lifestyle before. And if Joe's income is cut off or, you know, the mortgage has to be paid, that money's got to come from somewhere. If they had a big vacation plan and Joe dies, well, that vacation fund's going to get eaten up and it's going to go right to the mortgage protection or making sure the bills are paid. Right, so they're taken away from things to provide other things. But mortgage protection is pretty easy to kind of convey to our members because it's a physical thing. They live in their home. They know where their home is. They understand about how important their house is. Right, so mortgage protection is pretty easy to go over with them. Just kind of ask them what they, what they have to pay in mortgage, like what, 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 what's left on the mortgage, and just go from there. And if they're renting, same thing. Ask what they're making for rent and go from there. It's not too difficult. Do you guys have any questions on mortgage protection? No? Okay. And then the, 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 the fifth concern is child education, debt, or any kind of legacy they want to leave behind. Right? So this one is kind of three different ones. And you can, you can break it down per, per person, if that makes sense. Like use, use one per family. Like if you know that this is an older family and they don't have any kids right now, then don't even worry about the kids' education. Go into debt and legacy, right? But if they have some young kids, 100%. Guys, if they have young kids and you do not talk about child education, you're missing the boat. Because to be honest with you guys, all this stuff is great, but what parents really care about is bettering the next generation, bettering their next, their next kid can, making sure that their kids can do things that they didn't do. Like when I, I've been doing this for five years, guys, when I break this down and I ask them a question and I ask them, which is the most important, most of the time they say the kid's education, even if they have no other life insurance to protect anything else on here. They make sure their kids' education is protected because they want to better the next generation, right? So if they have kids, guys, and you're not talking about children's education, you're missing the boat. You're doing yourself and them a disservice, right? So let's say in this instance, they have kids. They have two of them, right? I'll make two little check marks. I'll say, Joe, Mary, you know, you know school is expensive, right? You know how much it costs for a kid to go to school nowadays? like a four-year university, and they'll tell you something. They'll probably say any value from, you know, $20,000 to $100,000. Right? Those are facts. That's what it costs to go to school. Ashton, you just graduated, right? What, what did it cost for you to go to school? What was your last semester? Um, I think... I think it was like 10 grand a year because it was in state, so. Mm -hmm. But still. So 40. 10,000 bucks a year. Yeah. And were you living at the house? Um, no, I had my apartment. You're on campus? Okay, okay. So, I mean, and that's in state. Like I went to WBU, I went to West Virginia University and I, I graduated in 2011, so 10 years ago, right? My last payment, that I had to pay for for everything. My last year, I believe, was twenty two thousand dollars. Twenty two grand. It's a lot of money, right? And and that was ten years ago. So nowadays, the average, you know, a four year university, about a hundred thousand dollars per child. What they recommend. So what they recommend for you, Mary and Joe, is to set a hundred thousand dollars aside for little Timmy and a little Sarah. Right? If they got three kids, project out three for a hundred thousand. Four, same thing. Right? What I tell the parents here is I say, Mary and Joe, I'm sure you want your kids to go to school, right? And they'll say yes. And what I would say is now, what we always say here at the company, Mary and Joe, is if if, if you're not here, at least give your kids the opportunity. Let them go to trade school, let them open up a business, let them go to college. 
This $100,000 that they're setting aside for their kids to better themselves doesn't have to go to college education. It could, it could go to open up a business, going to trade school, doing something. The fact of the matter is that if this family of two parents, if one of them passes away, the likelihood of this kid going to school gets cut in half. Right? So if in their family, they, you know, over time, they have an 80% of their, their kids going to school. If one of their family members dies, if the husband dies, there's a 40% chance that, that kid goes to school. So not only is he hurting his, his gen current generation, he's hurting his future generation as well. All right, so kids' education is pretty easy. Break, break it down about $100,000 per kid. Debt. That's something you're going to have to talk to them about. And I would say Mary, you know, Mary and Joe, another, another big reason or another big area where our members, you know, found concern was protecting their debt, making sure that if they did pass away, that their loved one didn't incur that debt. Right? So do you guys have any kind of crazy debt? You have any outstanding credit card debt, any kind of student loans, anything like that? And I just break it down with them. So Joe, what do you, what do you got? What, what do you got damage on your credit card left? Oh, 5,000, not too bad. Okay. And then you guys have any student loans left or anything like that? About 10,000 student loans. Okay. And then um, like car payments, things like that as well. You guys, you guys own the cars outright. No, you, you took out some loans for those too. Okay. You have about, about another 15,000 in loans for the cars. Right. Now, guys, when I'm talking about debt, I'm not talking about two, three, four hundred dollars. I'm talking about thousands. Okay. So if they're like, oh yeah, my credit card is like two hundred dollars past due, it's nothing. It's nothing. But if they owe 80 grand on student loans, it's a different thing. Right? So whatever their debt is, break it down and then total it up. So right now they got thirty thousand dollars in debt in this family. So if something happened to Joe, his estate is going to be positive 100,000 and negative 30,000. But really, he's only got 70,000 in his debt. So really, he's only got 70,000 positive in his estate because of that 30,000 in debt. All right? So this would protect that 30,000. And then legacy. Legacy would be if someone doesn't have debt, someone doesn't have kids, if someone just wants to leave money to their family. All right? So Mary, Mary and John, I know you guys don't have any kids yet or any, any kids down, you know, they're all out of the house. They're all taken care of. You know, you guys have done great with debt. Um, but with the other area where, where a lot of our members, you know, uh, have a concern is, is, leaving something to their family down the road, right? And I would always ask you guys the question, you know, would you want to leave your family a liability or would you want to leave your family a legacy, right? Because if, if you die and you don't have life insurance, you're leaving your family a liability. Now, if you die and you have life insurance to protect everything you need and then some, you're leaving your family with a big legacy. They're going to use that money for other things. Right. Maybe uh, the grandkids can go to school. Maybe they can, you know, open up a nonprofit organization or maybe, you know, your kids can just take that that family vacation. You guys never got to go on. So legacy can be used for a lot of different things. And there's no real value amount to it. It's kind of just what they want to leave. Right, so you'll, you'll, you'll run into some people who are like, yeah, I'm covered. But you know what? I want to leave my family a little bit of extra money. That's legacy, putting it down to the future, right? So do you guys have, I mean, and, and, and keep in mind like the kids' education, the debt and the legacy, it's, it's all interchangeable right there. So just kind of pick one avenue and go after it with them on that point. Most of the time it's gonna be kids' education though, okay? Um, but do you guys have any questions on, on the, the, the fifth concern here? All right, beautiful, all right. Now, the sixth concern, it's not up on the pie chart, 
But the sixth concern is affordability and being able to qualify for the benefits, right? So the next step is to actually go into the qualifications and the affordability part. That would be the needs analysis, all right? But before we go into the needs analysis, Joe and Mary, you always make me ask you one question. And keep in mind, there's no right or wrong answer to this question. So Joe, if God forbid you did not come home from work tomorrow, and you can guarantee that either your final expenses, your income, your mortgage, or your kid's education was protected, what would you say is the most important to you? Right, and, and they would say something like, I don't know, income protection. Whatever they say, I circle. So Joe, you would say income protection. Why would you say income protection, Joe? And he would say something like, Jesus. He would say something like, oh, because, you know, my paycheck's important and, I, and, and, and my family would lose a lot of money or the paycheck's very important. It pays for a lot of things, right? And then I would say, Joe, I know your paycheck's important, but what does your paycheck actually provide for the family? What I'm trying to do here, guys, is I'm trying to get them to sell themselves on why they need it. All right, so I'm asking them, what is the most important? And then I'm letting them tell me and circling it. Then I'm asking them why it's important to them. So, I, but after I ask them why it's important, I don't stop there. I go another step deeper. He would say, my paycheck's important because, you know, it brings money into the home. I would say, yes, it is very important. But what does that money that you bring into the home every single month do for the family? Right, you see how I'm asking him to break down his paycheck on what he spends his paycheck on? Because in his mind, his paycheck is just his paycheck. But what I want him to get to realize is his paycheck pays for everything else. His paycheck keeps the phones paid. His paycheck keeps the lights on. His paycheck makes sure the family can watch Netflix at night and make sure that they can eat the popcorn with the movies that they had they're watching. All that small stuff that he doesn't really think about on a day-to-day -day basis, that's what I want to bring to light. Because he's, he remembers that small stuff. He remembers what the paycheck does for his family. And if I can bring that to light, then and there's no protection there, then he knows he needs it. He sold himself. That's what we're getting them to do right here, is to sell themselves on why they need it. And I'm going to ask Mary the same question. And I don't ask them together. I ask them separately because I want to see what their, what their answers are separately. I don't say, Mary, same question for you. If you died tomorrow and you didn't come home and you could guarantee that one of these was protected forever, what would you say is the most important to you? She might say kids education. And I would say, okay, that's actually what most members say. Why would you say kids education though? Well, you know, I want my kids to go to school down the road and, and better themselves. Okay, but, but Mary, Mary, why is the kids going to school important to you though? What would that do for their futures? You see how I'm like guiding them to say the right things, guiding them to make their, their decision in their mind, right? So you have to ask them, Mary and Joe, if you died tomorrow to protect any one of these, which one would you say is the most important? Why? And then why again, right? Because you're getting them to sell themselves on why they need it. And then why this, is, why this is important to circle these is because when you're working through the options with them and if you have to minimize or reduce something down, take away the other things, but keep these two big things that they wanted on the policy because you're giving them what they want and what they need, right? So, I mean, that's basically the list of concerns. And after you get done with that, after you get done with asking them the two questions, you know, if something happened to you, Joe, who would, who would you, you know, which is the most important to you and why? You're going to transition right into the needs analysis. So you're going to go right from this slide here, right over, or, you know, I know you guys do it on the whiteboard, but you're going to go from right there, right into the needs analysis. And in the needs analysis, it'll break down everything for them individually, right? 
And based on what it says, you can show them again what it recommends. So while we do this, the long version here, so when those videos pop up, all I have to do is just reiterate to them, re-show them, hey, you remember when I was telling you about final expense protection and what it would, what it would bring up for you guys? So I want you guys to use this pie chart as like an active workspace for them. Like every single one of these should be different. And you should not just go through the motions when you're talking about the list of concerns. It has to be, this has to be a point where you're coming from passion, right? Your voice inflection has to change here. You have to be up, you have to be down. You can't just be like, so the first concern is final expense protection. And what that recommends is $30,000 of whole life insurance in force. They're not going to pay attention to you, right? Especially with you doing it virtual, you're not in front of them. You got to be entertaining. Right? It's going to set you aside from other people. Now, with the list of concerns, like I said, this is probably the most important section on here because you're getting them to sell themselves on why they need it. Okay. But the list of concerns comes from, like I said, it comes from our, our labor advisory board. It comes from real people. And every single year that these people have different concerns. So right now I'm using the main concerns. These might change down the road. They probably won't, to be honest, because these are the four areas where most people use life insurance to protect as well. And if they're not in a union, that's how you can kind of convey this. Instead of saying, hey, you know, your union set this up. You could say, no, now the main areas where most people use life insurance our final expenses, income, mortgage, and kids' education, right? So instead of going the union route, if it's a child safe or a will kit, you can go this route with it. The four main areas where most people use life insurance, right? So, I mean, do you guys have any other questions on that at all? No? Nope. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that's basically it. Usually we got more people in here and they're asking questions and I had to take some time to answer questions. But if you guys are good, that's basically it for me. I mean, my, my job is to go over the list of concerns and make sure you understand how to break it down for them. And keep in mind too, guys, if they do have coverage, let's say that they do have like 500,000 of, of term to protect their income. And that's what it would recommend for them. Cross it out for them, right? Make them feel good. You guys did a phenomenal job. You got that $500,000 of coverage. You guys did a great job, right? But there's still three other areas where you need to cover. Visually show them that. Yes. Um, everything you said, great. A lot of information. Oh, how it's supposed to be, how to break it down, how to bring the emotions and things to it. I was in an appointment last night with Marvin. And one thing they, they did basically they said they had a $200,000 20 year paid up, you know, and uh, I don't know if it was a lie because they didn't even let us look at the, uh, at, at the policy, but, um, but that would have taken care of the housing or, or not the house, the mortgage, not the more, I mean, what was it? The debt that they're in about 300,000 in there, 300,000 yeah. in debt. And I try to address in the fact that, and I literally just searched it up on my phone. Cause I was like, okay, so if they have State Farm, which is a cooperative company, it's going to take eight months for them to pay out anything, which is an equivalent of 240 days. And I just searched it up on Google, but the bank only gives you 120 days until they actually put your house in foreclosure. So now there is another hole right there that, okay, even if you don't want to go with the $200,000 option, at least cover that hole during the eight months before you get your 500000 with 30 racks. So at least you could pay your mortgage until you get the rest of your money because you're going to lose the house anyway. Huge, huge. I, and, I, literally just, I literally just searched it up and I looked. I'm like, okay, home foreclosure times 120 days. Payouts for insurance, 240 days. It's literally half of the time. So in, in half of the time, you're going to lose the house and you're still going to come up with $500,000, but now you don't have the house. Dude, that is huge. What you're doing, that extra homework you're doing right now is huge because you're gaining small inches that people aren't doing. And this is what I recommend all my team does. I, have, I, I make them have a notebook. At, and every single sit, they write down three things they did good, three things they did bad. And then if there's anything that they didn't know, they write that down as well. And their homework the next day is to research that. So if they say, I have life insurance through 
on Lincoln Heritage and you don't know who Lincoln Heritage is, your, your job for the night, look them up. That's it. Right. So next time when they say they have Lincoln Heritage, you're like, oh, I'm familiar with what they do. They do this, this, and this. There's still a gap for this. And remember, like right? I said, it takes five, eight months for them to be able to blah, 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 blah. Okay. So here's where we fill in the gaps. We're filling in gaps. That's, that's, that's another gap that like visually they don't see because they see the 500,000 here and the 200,000 of their, their mortgage and they just link it together. But no, there's a big hole in between of eight months. <clears throat> yep. Well, I mean, 100%. So that just... Like that's the beauty of doing this and representing it visually is you can put in their exact numbers and show them what they have and how it's working for. Now, you guys have to make sure that you're the expert though. You have to project yourself as the expert, right? You guys are not experts yet. You'll get there. You'll get there. But you kind of just have to kind of fake it until you get to that point. Fake right? it until you make it. But knowing a good generalization of what they need most of the time is going to help you with that. It's going to make you look <laughs> smarter. Because two, let's say that you do say it recommends 30000 of whole life. And it, do, it does recommend $500,000 of, of um, income protection. And then it recommends 150000 of mortgage protection. Chances are when you put all this information into the needs analysis, it's going to spit out these numbers anyway. Right. And then you're going to look very smart to them. You're going to look like, you know what you're doing, but if you're not, if you don't project yourself as the expert, they're never going to believe it. That's why going through term and hole with them needs to be like done in a, in a, in a, in a good concise way. So they understand it. Even if they like, and I know Josh went over this, but it's always one thing I tell agents, like, even if they know, life insurance, if they have life insurance, if they know about it, don't just assume that they know term and hold. Say, oh, I know that you have some basic knowledge, but they always make me go over this. Term does this, whole life does this. Well, you can speed the explanation up a little bit, but don't ever skip it. Does that make sense? Because you're skipping what makes us unique as a company. What makes us unique is, is the fact that we break this down for them and we're actually individualizing it for the family. They're not just picking numbers from a page online. Like when most people get life insurance nowadays, guys, I don't know if you know this or not, but what they do is they go to a website, they type in numbers, they type in their age and their health, and then they pick numbers on a page. It says $500,000 of coverage for this amount of money, 400,000 for this amount of money. They don't know what that is. They just see a big number for a small number and they go with it. A lot of the time it's policies that aren't gonna help them. 10 year terms, 20 year terms, it's not right for them but they don't have anybody that's speaking to them and showing them what they need and how it's going to work. They're just doing it on their own. Right. And a lot of people you'll see think they have knowledge on life insurance because, Oh, somebody told me about this. Well, that person that told them was probably wrong. They weren't an expert. They didn't go to a seven hour class where they had to sit there and go over this stuff. They didn't go through a course online to get their license. You guys did that, right? They didn't do that stuff. They're not experts. Same way as if, if you guys go out to, you know, this union members, you know, if he's a carpenter and you go to his house and, and the house he's building right now, you're not going to know what to do, right? You're in a different land. Same with him. He's in a different land of, of finances. You've got to be the expert. You've got to guide him through it, right? So even if the like, like I've, I've definitely had this where people are like, man, I don't really even want to go through this. Well, I get that. I do. I get that. Um, you know, it might seem like a lot, but you know, your union has this set up for you and me as your expert to walk you through it. So, I mean, it's really only just going to benefit you guys. And, and I, I would be, a, I would do, be doing you guys a disservice if I didn't show you what, what, what it would recommend for you. That's a great line to use on them. I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't show you everything the union had set up for you. I would show you, a, it would be a disservice if I didn't show you everything that, you know, um, the extra benefits could help your family out with. All right, so the list of concerns, guys, like I said, is, is uh, many times, it's a very important part of, of the whole sales process. And there's a lot of little hidden things in here, like getting them to decide on what they want done, getting them to, to pick what's most important to them, getting them to sell themselves on it, right? Um, and, and, and the main thing, what you should do is visually break it down from here. That's what I'm getting at. 
visually representing their needs. Because at a lot of the time, like I said, life insurance is intangible. It's not thing, anything they can hold in their hand. They have to see something that it's gonna represent and take it away from them, right? I'm showing them that, you know, they, Joe, you're, you're a $200,000 asset to your house, but I'm taking you away. I'm removing you from the situation. Now you have a $200,000 gap here, right? Um, but being, other than that, guys, do you have any other questions for me on anything? I'm here for you. I got, I got another half an hour. No? All right, quick question. Um, the line that we'd say that in 2005, George Bush stated that all insurance companies could take up to it. Hello? Can you hear me now? I can't. You're, Hello? you're cutting in and out. Huh. Hello? I can hear you now. Can you hear me? All right, uh, perfect. I did. So that line that we say, hey, can you hear me? Okay, good. So the line that we'd say, George Bush stated in 2005 that all insurance companies could take up to eight months. I tried searching it up online and I can't find anywhere where to, because I had somebody show me like a long time ago. Somebody actually like had me like, like show me, show me where does it say it. And I tried looking for it. I can't find it. What, well, I missed the whole, I missed the first part of that, what you said. The line where we say, all insurance companies could take up to eight months to pay off a death benefit because George Bush in 2005 stated it and like passed a law stating that. Yeah. Look, Where do I find it? Look up the Pension Protection Act. Pension I look, Protection I, Act. I, I, Pension Protection Act of 2006, right? Mm-hmm. Strength protections for workers own pensions benefits. It greatly increases the amount that a workers can contribute to re retirement plans. It means possible to directly convert 401ks to 403b and 457 plan access. Okay. So I I'm going to have to read the whole article then. Pension yeah. protection. In, in there, it states that, that life insurance companies have a certain amount of time to pay out their members. Before that, there wasn't really anything in place. And a lot of people lost a lot of money when the stock market went down and Enron and all those big corporations shut down. Um, yeah, a lot of because lost they, a lot of they, life insurance. They can't pay those insurance, but those insurance companies can't pay it off because if they're cooperative, that means that they work with the stock market and if the stock market is down, they are down. That's why we as Americans are a non cooperative it's, company. Correct. We don't, That's we, why don't we have we don't, a big bucket um, where all the money goes to. Exactly. There's no competition with, with our company. We don't put any money into stocks or investments or anything like that. So that we can guarantee a four and a half percent rate of growth. Right. And we're also, that's how we pay out our claims quickly too, is we don't have to go. Like you got to think about this. If you have a company like, let's just say State Farm, and they have a universal policy that's invested somewhere and they're actively making money on those investments. Are they just going to give you your money right back? If they're making money on your money? Hell no. They have to it's like sell if I it. borrowed twenty dollars from you, and every single day I made a dollar on that twenty dollars, how long would it take me to pay you back? Until I have my own twenty, at least, right? So that's the way most companies think. It, it, they're using your money to make money for themselves, so they're not just going to give you your money back. They're going to use that whole time to get more money, so that they can pay you your money without a loss. <laughs> and you know, and you know what the process of it is. We don't have to worry I, about that. I work at a big pot. Yeah, in fact, if true. all of our members died tomorrow, we could pay every single claim out and then still open up our doors the next day. Yeah, that's, right? that's, that's crazy. So one also, thing about our company is that it's huge. That is huge. Another thing that I, I got explained before because I did work at American Income before. Um, mm -hmm. So when a, co when a cooperative company has to pay off their benefit, let's say that you have $200,000 worth of your benefit and then they're going to take up to eight months to pay it out, but you're going to reach to them to get your money. So what they're going to do is they're going to call you in for an appointment and uh, you're going to sit down in an office with a financial advisor, which is going to say, okay, we're going to give you 50 or $20,000, this amount every month. And then with the remaining balance, you're going to talk to our financial advisor so you could invest it within the company itself. 
And then you're going to deny that claim. You're going to deny mm-hmm. that claim. You're going to deny it. They're going to say, no, I don't want to invest my money. I don't want to invest my money. And it's going to take eight months for them to say, okay, here's your money. They want mm-hmm. you to invest it within the company with their financial advisors. So you don't make any bad decisions and with that much money. Exactly. That's a big the thing big that they explain, man. I'm like, wow, that's, that, that's, that's bogus. <laughs> yeah, another thing about work coverage is the fact that <laughs> that company, when they get work coverage for their members, they buy it before tax money. They use pre-tax dollars to buy that. Right, Which so that when it comes out, to you the will member, be taxed. They get taxed on it. They get taxed on it when they make that claim. So number one, they got to make a claim. Question. Number two, they lose money. So it's not one hundred fifty thousand. You might be getting one hundred thirty thousand. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're right. There's a and lot of hidden things with with work coverage, and that's why our company exists. So they don't have to rely on work coverage. They can keep us low. You know, union negotiated rates, whole life insurance, keep it flat and level for you. You can build on it down the road. You know, so, yeah, I mean, all those small little things that you learn from the other agency are huge, huge, man. Now, another person asked me, so you guys put all the money into a bucket. Everybody puts their money into a bucket. Every single person puts money into a bucket. Now, how does the company make money? If you guys are not investing money into the stock market and you guys are giving giving back the money that people put into their policies because it's in a big bucket and it's not growing, how does the company make money? I had somebody ask me that, like, okay, so how does American income make money then? If you guys are giving back the money they put in the bucket. Yeah. I mean, their their money is is safely invested. It safely goes somewhere. It's not just like out in some crazy investments. It safely grows at four and a half percent. That's why we can keep everything together. And when we keep it all together, we can invest more of it in a big lump lump sum so that more of it comes in. See what I'm saying? And that that's where the question came in because I explained them. So your, your money grows off 4.5% interest, right? And they're like, okay, but if you guys are a non-cooperative company, where are you investing that money? Well, how is it growing? You know, like if it's not in the stock market, where is it at? To grow. It's, it's growing. I wouldn't even tell them to worry about it. It grows. It grows. Yeah, I know. It, 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 um, it, it just grows. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, you, you guys, you guys have any other questions for me at all? Um, shit. Um, I got a bunch of calls I got to make back here, but, um, but yeah, so other than that, guys, I know you guys are running with some people today. You got some stuff with Thomas later today. Um, are you, are you out in the field today too? Lee? Yeah. Yeah. Me. Oh, I, I, I have gastric problems and I woke up really, really, really sick today. Like I've, my breakfast, I threw it up. Uh, lunch, I haven't even had lunch yet because I'm scared of throwing it up. And I have to call up, make an appointment with my gastroenterologist and stuff. I don't know why I woke up like this today. But yeah, I'm feeling <laughs> like crap. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you sticking it out with me here today, man, and, and, and learning some things. Okay, good. Well, well, get better, man. And, and um, Ashlyn, have some fun with Tommy tonight. Get ready. You're presenting some of the presentation, right? Yep. I know you weren't ready yesterday, but you're definitely doing it today. So no, no ends and buts about it. All right. But uh, other than that, guys, you guys both have my number. Shoot me a phone call if you need anything. Text, call. I'm here for you. Okay. It's a pleasure Thank getting to hang so out much. with you today. Thank you. Have Drew. a good one. Thank uh, you. See you guys. Bye.